so I'm just going to continue from where we stopped last time. Um, this is just to ease you in, not just to ease you in, but this is a easier point uh, of the course. Uh, so we will ease into digital payments and look at uh, some of the uh, systems. You already know these uh, in your day-to-day -day life, you have been using them. So we'll just look at what they are and see what the developments have been. And then what I thought was, I thought I'll well, do a slight change in um, the structure. And before I go very in depth into the payment instruments and the infrastructure to touch on the institutional framework and the actors and give you a background of the legal framework and then go deeper into the into the individual uh, instruments uh, and so that you will have an idea of what why some of them have certain features because they are then i can teach them to you with the legal background and the relevant regulation and it, it will have a better connection otherwise um, you will know features, but you won't know why those features are there. So I want you to just have that idea as well. Um, yeah, so let me share my screen. Let's see, let's see, yeah, yeah. Right, um, so I just put it as 2.2 because it's a continuation of the payment instruments um, lecture. So just to sort of recap, uh, we were on this point of uh, payment instruments. Um, so same goes as uh, we were discussing last time. Uh, if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to stop me and ask. Um, right, so we looked at cards last time, right? Um, and how uh, the types of cards, we looked at uh, credits, debit, stored value cards. In Sri Lanka, there are no charge cards and what they do. So, times how the cards um, increase their usage. Um, so, basically, if you look at it from the evolution perspective, uh, we are here. Uh, we passed this point, we passed this point, and now we're at this point. Uh, we also looked at this evolution. And uh, so we passed 1997. Uh, and now we're slowly making our way down the timeline, right? So that's what we also internet banking, mobile money, QR codes. And then subsequently, we will be going to even more advanced payment uh, systems, uh, payment methods that we have, right? Um, right, so just a small recap. This is a slide from last time. Um, so just to remind you what digitalization of payments and systems is, I'm reminding you this because um, uh, sort of repetition is the best way to remember things, right? So when we are looking at digitalization as bankers, as anyone who's involved in any digitalization process, always remember that there is a back end and a front end. There is the front end is what the customers see. Like for instance, the interface that we see now, what you are seeing now is the front end, is how the customer uses it. I as the user of PowerPoint and Google, um, what is this? Uh, it's not uh, the, the so this, I don't know what the Google system is called. Oh, Meet, it's called Meet. Um, uh, so that interface is the front end and there is a bunch of processors and functionalities that are given for the front end for the customers to use. And then there's a whole load of processing going at the back end where Google processors, the, the data, the, the linkages with uh, the, the 
the files that are saved in my computer, all those functions are going in the backend, which we can't see, right? So in the same way, in a payment system also, uh, there is the customer facing end. The, it will be the app, the mobile money, uh, wallet, um, the check. Those are all customer facing um, ends of um, a payment system. And then you have the back end processes. If you are in a bank or if you are in any um, financial service, you will you would have seen the back end. Um, and most of the time, most bankers uh, work in the back end. But if you're in a branch, you kind of see what the customer sees. You are in a middle point. You're sort of in an intermediary point of connecting the customer and the back end. So you're sort of the intermediary that connects the two. Um, so uh, as we discussed last time, a lot of the digitization happened for the large value payments, right? So companies, uh, businesses were using digital payments much earlier than customers. Customers were using cash for a long time because uh, retail customers didn't have any infrastructure on them that the financial service provider, which is mainly the bank, had a way to connect extend their digital infrastructure, their internal backend processes to the customer, right? But companies were able to invest in computer systems and use the, the conveniences of digital systems that banks had. But now with the mobile phone and personal computers, um, banks finally have a way, uh, an infrastructure right, a little the phone or the personal computer, some digital device that they can connect to the customer with. So that this has resulted in the front end processors uh, getting digitalized, right? So that is a reminder of what we discussed last time. Um, so digital payments and instrument methods. So we discussed cards last time. So cards are uh, a familiar, a payment instrument that we don't really call it digital. I mean, in our in our minds, when we say digital payment methods, we don't think of cards. We think of mobile apps or mobile phone based uh, digital payment methods. Uh, but cards have evolved uh, to become a part of a digital payment method, right? Or actually quite worse that. And that's why we started with cards. It's you know, it's sort of the, the the thing the payment instrument that has evolved through time to still stay quite relevant um but if we look at digital payment instruments per se i think this is a good point for us to look at a definition what would be a, di a, di a digital payment right so uh, digital payments are also called electronic payments the reason that we use digital payments is just because digital is um, more uh, common word now. Electronic is kind of slightly outdated and most people don't know what electronic means. Um, and whereas now more people know what digital means because of the smartphone and the computer, because we don't use the term electronic on, uh, though we use words like e-commerce, we don't use things like electronic commerce, right? So therefore, um, the word E is almost synonymous with digital, but not E electronic payment, right? So this is this is just words so that uh, people can understand what is going on better, right? So a digital payment is uh, the transfer of value from one payment account to another. So there are two payment accounts. Remember, this, this is an important thing. There are always two payment accounts, right? It can be in any form, but there are two payment accounts. Using a digital device, right? Such as a mobile phone, point of sale, the, the machine, the POS machine, which is what you put the card in uh, at the merchant or a computer, a digital communications uh, channel, uh, such as uh, mobile networks or SWIFT, uh, 
I don't know if everyone has heard of Swift. Uh, does anyone know what Swift is? Uh, international bank to bank transferring mechanism. Sorry, can you just hello? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. International uh, bank to bank transferring mechanism. Or so Swift is not uh, yes. So uh, correct interbank yes, um, and it is for tra interbank transfers. It is uh, not a mechanism per se. It is a messaging system so it's uh, for financial community telecommunication and um so it's for the society for worldwide interbank te financial telecommunication and uh, what it does is it sends messages right so if you are using uh swift uh, you will know um you you have to send uh swift messages so not only um Internationally, you you can you send Swift messages locally as well. So uh, to RTGS, uh, to Lanka Clear, uh, you can send Swift messages. It is the messaging uh, platform sort of thing, right? So when we are making a digital, uh, when we are making a digital payment, um, the message has to go to say, okay, the instructions have to go in a message. And that message is not going via the, the normal internet or uh, via the phone or anything like that. Swift is specifically made, like it's a standardized form so that world over, everyone sends the message in one particular way so that anyone, anyone who's using those uh, messages have very clear instructions as to what to do uh, on the other end. So that is what Swift is. So, for electronic payments or for digital payments, Swift has, is, is, is uh, quite important. Um, and you can now, for instance, you can also have local uh, messaging systems. Now, for instance, India has a local version for their Swift. So for domestic Indian rupee transactions, they don't use Swift because since it's an international uh, platform, you know, the uh, guys in uh, uh, Swift, I think is in Basel as well, uh, or Switzerland, um, somewhere in Switzerland. So therefore, you know, the, the, the foreign operators can see the messages at the end of the day. So there are risks involved and they can, they can limit your access if they want to. Um, so to avoid that for things like national security, India decided to develop their own uh, Swift uh, uh, so one uh, financial messaging uh, platform, but that's about Swift. Uh, but just for the the reason I uh, wanted to just explain Swift to you is because that is a very important underlying technology that enables digital communications, and banks have to use this quite a bit. Um, so uh, when we say digital payments, it includes interbank transfers, mobile money, payment cards, all of them are um, included in uh, what is uh, considered uh, digital payments. So I got this definition from the World Bank has this um, uh, initiative called Better Than Cash. Right, where they promote digital payments. So if you want, there's a lot of resources there. You can go and uh, the link is here, so you can go and check the check that out. Right. Um, right. So we'll start with internet banking. So internet banking is we all know internet banking. Uh, it's online banking. When we say internet banking. Um, so in Sri Lanka, internet banking was introduced in 1999, right? And um, it's when you, very simply put, it's when you access your bank account via the internet, right? Um, so as you know, we already know that there are many facilities for internet banking, um, but internet banking on its own is kind of losing its uh, its popularity as a term because of uh, mobile banking and mobile apps. Um, 
overall, we are seeing mainly due to COVID, uh, a huge increase in internet banking, right? Uh, there's a percentage change of volume of over 150% uh, for the two quarters, right? Uh, that is 2020 quarter three and 2021 quarter three, a huge jump in internet banking. More people are moving to online banking and we're seeing even uh, senior uh, customers are learning to use internet banking, which is a great thing. Um, and in terms of uh, value, right? Uh, there is a huge growth again, um, a fifty percent growth. That's quite a quite a impressive growth. We've had the numbers have been quite high, uh, even in twenty twenty with uh, the with COVID, but it has continued to grow. Um, in your experience at the banks, uh, have you noticed uh, a reduction in? I mean, yes, with, with uh, customers um, coming has become less, but do you see any changes where customers are now using internet banking more? Are you seeing some behavioral changes uh, with the customers where they, are, where they prefer not to come to the bank? Um, everyone, okay, so we we'll assume that the numbers are as it is. Yeah, does anyone have a comment on that one? Are you seeing any changes in your branches? Yes, uh, many of the customers have. Uh, uh, move into uh, online platforms rather than physical branch visits right now. So it is evident in day to day work time. So, sorry, you're based in, uh, are you the one based in Kamu City? Yeah, I'm from Kamu. Yeah, so even in Kamu City, do you see that change? Uh... Yeah, yeah, normally uh, uh, when we compare to pre COVID, pre pandemic. Uh, era and the present situation there's a huge improvement you in have less customers coming in yeah especially for these uh, loans and advances related matters customers uh, I think they are mainly using telephone calls and online platforms uh, rather than visiting the branches uh, even the documentation they are trying to send it through online channels or emails or whatsapp or something yeah. So do you see any are you all making any changes in the branches? Because I mean the, there are less customers if there are less customers coming in, I you all might didn't have to change the kind of work that you do, right? Like less customer facing but more phone and um, you you know because I also do the same because to be honest now my my bank branch is not even five minutes distance from my office, but I you know, still call and get things done um, and hand them email rather than uh, going to the bank. So it's a natural sort of transition we have, I think many of us have made, especially with COVID. Um, and it's not that the, the technology has changed or any new facility has been given. I mean, all these things were there before COVID. Uh, but the things that we used to go to go to the bank and do, we just don't see a need now, or we try to avoid doing it. Um, so, are you all like looking at how to respond to this, or is it in your current systems are still able to ha handle these changes? Actually, there were systems in place which were underutilized <laughs> before this COVID, I suppose. So. With the COVID matter, uh, the, uh, people are more or, more or less using more the facilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's systems yeah. were there. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. Systems were there. It's just that no one thought of using them like that. 
um, so so it must be different for you as well the experience so that is uh, how internet banking has really sort of covid and internet banking has changed the combination has changed i think banking the traditional type of banking as well uh, now we go to mobile money before we go to more advanced ways so mobile money is a, a mobile payment based system on accounts held by a mobile operator right so now we are looking at uh, actors in the payment ecosystem who are not banks right um, and they can access uh, the funds from the customer's mobile phone right um, so it has it goes as mobile money or e-money right um, and you can collect it at the retail store now this is I, I put this picture this is from i think uh, probably in pesa um <coughs> because of, for mobile money you don't need a, a smartphone right so you need a feature phone and uh, the the uh, the uploading everything happens on a sort of sms uh, based system right and you mostly this is this originally started with uh, upload in a way to deposit cash into a electronic wallet right that was held in a phone right um, so the the root of mobile money is in um, have i explained this in my now so the root of the history of mobile money is uh, starts with in Kenya uh, when uh, Safaricom in Kenya um, got together with uh, so Safaricom is there is a very famous um, mobile operator in the in Europe called Vodafone so Safaricom is really linked in with uh, Vodafone and they came up with this uh, model and it was mainly for financial inclusion because in Africa there are very few uh, the the density of banks is very um, low so therefore uh, people didn't have access to banks so they didn't have way to transfer money through a uh, distance and it being a big country people come to the city to uh, earn money they don't have a way to send money to uh, their families living in the villages so this model came up to solve this issue where you can instead of going to a bank get the cash from a retail store in the village or and you can up you can uh, deposit the money into the account from a retail store instead of going to the bank right um so it was for a system to provide banking facilities to the unbanked right uh, so in sri lanka there are two uh, categories of mobile money that comes come under the uh, regulation so this particular mobile money that i'm just described comes as mobile phone based e money systems now we need discuss the regulations uh, you will see in these two categories customer account based mobile payments now those are the um, mobile payment uh, phone banking systems that customers have with banks right so that is based on a customer's bank account so in the regulation when we are discussing the regulation we can go into detail for that right the difference between the two um, the mobile phone based e-money system is the one that the mobile operators use right so they are the mobile uh, phone based e-money system the issue, money uh, value is issued upon the receipt of funds and it is stored electronically for the purpose of using for payments via the mobile phone itself right um so um how e-money works is the 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 back end the, the business model of it, uh, it that's regulated in Sri Lanka right so 
in um, in Kenya, in Uganda, the model is to give the license to the mobile operator. But here in Sri Lanka, that's on the way. The license is given to the bank. So the mobile operators have to come with a bank. They have a custodian bank, right? And this is to ensure the safety of um, the funds of people because these companies, the mobile operator is holding the, pub, the customer's funds in their account. So if something happens, just like the banks, right? They're holding the customer's funds. Now that can create a risk. In, in the end, this is in electronic form. So if something happens that the money is lost, uh, the customer has to be safeguarded, right? So with that, uh, with that idea, now banks are very stringently regulated by the central bank to ensure the safety of funds. And we know in Sri Lanka, the banking system is quite well. We don't hear of customers losing their money the, the banks losing customers money so that is because the banks have a lot of safeguards in place right um so because the banks are already involved in this process the regulatory model in sri lanka is that we say one to one the mobile operator has to maintain the same amount of money that customers have in their uh, mobile wallets the same amount has to be held in a custodian account in the bank, right? And the bank has to make sure that it is one-to-one -one, uh, held. So if a customer goes and uh, deposits or tops up, reloads, whatever word that they will use, let's say 100 rupees into their easy cash or M cash, then Easy Cash or Mcash dialog or Mobitel has to add 100 rupees to their custodian account, right? So those balances must always match, right? So it's a trusty arrangement to ensure customer protection, right? So in case, let's say, um, something happens to dialog or Mobitel system and the money is lost, the same amount is already held with the bank so the customer can get their money back, right? So that, that is the model that uh, we use. And so this is a unique model that Sri Lanka came up with because um, we felt, because our banking system is quite advanced and um, it's quite safe, we were able to come up with this model. And um, this was actually featured in the Harvard Business School's uh, one of their issues as well uh, on uh, business research. And because this is a unique model, uh, which we came up to suit our context, right? Um, so we this is the way mobile money is used in Sri Lanka, right? And We can see now, like initially, when it started, the idea was, if you remember the ads long time ago, they were sending money to their families. Uh, so a lot of it was money transfer, right? But now we can see that the usage is cha has changed quite a lot. The composition has changed quite a lot for uh, mobile money-based um, mobile phone based e-money systems right a lot of it has about 90 percent is used for paying utility bills because the both the providers they pro, uh, they have this function in the in the uh, mobile wallet itself they have the function to pay utility bills so because of that the most of it is used for utility bill pay, payment and they have been adding new features so it's not just a money transfer system. You can see that money transfers themselves is um, quite quite uh, low, right? And uh, if you look, so this is the volume and this is the value, right? Volume side and value side. 
um, again, institutional payments that is, uh, I think, to pay the local governments and all those things, they have features that have been added. So um, we can see that it's it's getting more and more, it's evolving and getting more advanced uh, to give customers more facilities. So it's not just a money transfer system like we had before, right? Um, so if you look at the global, uh, global mobile uh, money usage, um, we can see that there are two, the composition is, is changing, right? So money is uh, loaded either from the bank. So in Sri Lanka also you can more now load from your bank to the wallet. Um, and then bulk disbursements are things like um, uh, what is like social payments and then you have remittances that's the way the, the mobile uh, wallets get topped up now in Sri Lanka also we can receive remittances to the mobile wallets so if uh, someone is abroad they can remit money to the uh, mobile wallet of their family right um, and um, now the way that it gets used internationally is uh, then it gets transferred from the wallet. It can, let's say it comes in as an uh, international remittance, especially if let's say it's a, it's a, like a cheaper way to uh, remit internationally. So then from the wallet, it goes into their bank, like 14%. Uh, and then for bill payments again, uh, quite high 16 percent for airtime that is uh, used for mobile as for, for talking on the phone uh, again uh, there are very few international remittances out so because this is a sort of peculiar new functionality that has come and you need remitting money out and remitting money in uh, has far more complex processes involved than remitting it internally in your local currency right and then off net transfers that is i think you need in cash right no it's not cash out i i don't know what off net transfers are to be honest uh this is from gsma so gsma is this institution that uh, was set up to um, promote uh, mobile money usage right um so you can that they have you can just type gsma and they have a lot of information on this um and most of them, as you can see, so there's a lot of money coming in as international remittances. Then there's about 68% coming in as, as cash. That is, let's say someone is working in the city and then they're putting the money in for a relative. And so bulk of the money, right, is going out as uh, cash out, right? Um, so the word P2P, if you don't know, it means peer-to-peer. -peer. That means uh, you don't need an intermediary. Uh, it, I mean, yes, there is an intermediary, but it's going directly from one phone to the other. So as far as the customer is concerned, it's a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Now, if you look at the global, so in Sri Lanka, it's not so large, but globally, mobile money is quite big, especially in countries uh, where there is a lot of uh, distance involved, right? Uh, and also the income levels as well. Now, if you look at it globally, uh, this was in, this is 2020 data. Um, and we can see that registered accounts, active accounts, transaction volumes, transaction values, everything has, increased right um so 690 million right that's quite a big increase now um if we look at um where should we look at now in south asia also there is a sorry In South Asia, 
uh, there is also an increase, but it's not such a drastic increase. We can see in kind of in areas like uh, the East Asia, Pacific, where we have countries like the Philippines and countries that are in archipelagos, uh, that which means we have islands, and then we don't have enough banks. In those areas, it the increase is higher, right? So the geographical context, the level of uh, the availability of banks, all of these factors affect the growth of mobile money because it is an alternative way of payment. It is not using the bank accounts, right? So that's why it's because it's an alternative way of uh, paying. You can see the behavior is different based on the region. Right, uh, now we'll quickly look at mobile apps, right? Now mobile apps is a different matter. Mobile apps use internet-based uh, mobile app, uh, like applications uh, for payments, right? And there are all sorts of um, mobile apps and uh, some of them work as wallets directly like apple pay and then some have some facilities peer to peer, peer payments like paypal right and then you have uh, certain ty types now if you take remittances that are these are now even western union goes as a, a digital e-remittance e service right uh, then for uh, so Uber, um, so this uh, this specification, they say phone only. I think it's you just use the phone for your purchases, like you use Open or Uber or Open Table is like a restaurant booking uh, app, uh, so that you can book the book the restaurant through. Um, open table and dash is like uber again it's like uber eats um and then um i, I don't know exactly what uh, career uh, carrier billing is i mean i'll just check that one out um so you can see that the use has changed in mobile apps so it's no longer you know, when earlier it was PayPal was what was well known, and that was appear to be a payment. It was, it was a wallet, it's a digital wallet. But now we can see a lot of customizing based on customer needs. And this evolution happens. So a payment app won't necessarily be seen as a payment app on its own. So that's something important to understand. Now, the whole point of this slide is to show that when we say payment app, now in Sri Lanka still, when we say payment app, we ask, we call, you know, the bank's payment app now. If you're from H&B, you say that my payment app is solo, or I think B or C would be smart pay. But um, actually, you can see here that there are a lot of other apps that are falling into the category of um payment apps now uber has a license as a payment service provider in europe right um so does uh, what, what is this um the 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 room uh, booking like you can go and leave in a, a person can rent their own home to tourists what is that oh gosh i could forget uh, the name um they so those are all considered payment apps because they have payment licenses right um and so these are the uh, changes that are happening now remittance services were not considered apps before but now they're coming in the form of apps so the thing that we call apps are changing with time and with technology and with increased demand. So when there's a lot of demand, you have space to customize. So you can say, okay, I'm just using my payment app is for this very, very specific purpose because there is a large enough market in that corner to, um, to be, uh, to just have a good business on that one, um, one, um, 
facility. Now, you can see things like Dunkin' Donuts, uh, Starbucks. Now, that means where they, uh, where you can top up the, you know, like you get points like Odell points or Softlogic points, uh, Sri Lankan Airlines points. So, these also, they started with points and then the, the points get used as cash and now people can top up those accounts. They have really evolved. Even these merchants uh, have evolved um, to have things like mobile wallets, right? That 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 reflect mobile wallets. So these are the changes that are happening. Right, uh, now we'll go to QR-based flow. So my mobile apps are going to QR-based payments because uh, QR-based payments uh, use one way of, uh, one interface of using a mobile app uh, uh, by a customer, right? So a QR code, is a payment solution. It's an alternative channel for initiating and accepting accepting a payment, right? Uh, so like the card, now the card is a payment instrument uh, because it has a certain set of uh, rules by which the payment happens. This is different, the QR code directly accesses the account itself, right? Now, um, the important features of QR code is that uh, it, the QR code itself can store a fairly large amount of data, right? And that data can be screened, uh, can be scan scanned and um, either on a screen or a paper. So now this ability to use either the static or the dynamic QR is very useful, especially for financial inclusion purposes, right? And it's also quite um, robust. So this is even if the code is slightly damaged, it can be read, right? And the information is encrypted in a, in a QR code. So it's safer, right? Um, now, a QR code can be scanned in uh, several ways. Um, so one is you can, the smartphone can scan the business's QR code. Uh, the business can uh, scan the customer's uh, QR code. So then app to app also, you can have inbuilt QR codes. I'm just going to uh, show you a video. It's this one here. So this one is in China. No, you cannot pay like this. Now I think they can use the Apple Pay, but not like here, here's so many options. And I always go there and say, oh, in China everything is more convenient. In major cities in China, such as Shanghai and Shenzhen, where we are right now, you can pay for virtually everything with your mobile phone. Mobile payment platforms say this is a more convenient way of consuming, but the convenience they bring might come at a cost. Sorry, can you hear what's going on in the, can you see what's going on in the video? Yes. Okay. 要求的時候,機構就會是如取如快去給他們 
政府點先可以 request 咗攞呢啲資料呢？其實我哋唔夠知。喺香港嘅 concept 就係、是，咦，我係一個機構，我俾呢個資料，代表佢可以俾佢嘅子務公司去用。咁所以，冇啲 m a t e r 係政府或者係私人機構，而係佢哋會唔會好清晰話俾我哋聽，佢點樣、嗯、去 share 我哋呢啲 information？ 所、so, 以 this one and the reason I selected this particular video is because it talks about not only the convenience of uh, using uh, mobile payments or not only QR codes,、uh, any mobile payment, but also the other side of the risks as well. So、uh, in a、uh, So, did you see the two sides that、uh, they were showing, the good side and the bad side? Because we had to read the subtitles. Did you see that? So basically, what they were saying was that okay, it's, and now if you actually go to China. Sometimes you can't pay with cash at all. They they don't accept it, and everywhere they use a QR code. It became it 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 was able to leapfrog in terms of payment technology because they were very behind for some time. They were only using cash, and then they didn't have credit cards or debit cards. So that phase they didn't have in、um, China. So they immediately jumped from cash to QR, and QR is a very low tech. In the sense,、um, it's the com.、Uh, it's a very safe technology, but it is a low cost technology, right? That's why you can use paper and the screen as well, right?、Uh, so it's a very、um, robust technology. So it's very easy to disperse even、uh, to、uh, smaller merchants who don't, who have very low, like the the the, the vegetable sellers and all of that,、uh, because even in this Lanka QR picture, just This one you can see we put the family、uh, seller because that is the target market as well. You can go very, very micro level to、um, to to achieve that. But of course, the other side is now as these things grow, we have to look at things like information. Where does the information go? Who is using the information? In Sri Lanka at the moment, the regulation is such that the bank has to hold the So、uh, data, the customer's data, here held with the bank. So even if you have a fintech app that is not a bank-based fintech app, they still have to come with the bank, and because the customer data is held with the bank, and that is、uh, how we regulate, right?、Um, so, but in this, in that,、uh, in that、uh, video, they were saying that when you use things like Alipay and Tencent, even if you're living abroad, your Data all goes to China. The Chinese government can see your、uh, personal information and financial information. So these are sort of the concerns that we had to always look at both sides. And considering those kind of risks in Sri Lanka, we decided、uh, we have for all these apps and、uh, its payment systems, the data has to、uh, be held with the bank locally, right? So that we the, because we know that the banks are. Holding this data quite safely, right? Now in、uh, Sri Lanka, as you know, we launched Lanka QR,、um, and uh, so Lanka QR is a QR code standard, right? So which means that all the banks and fintechs, so whoever who issues a Lanka QR through their mobile app, has to follow the standard set out by the Lanka QR. Uh, uh, regulations, right? So this standard is based on an international standard called EMB Core, and that makes it interoperable with、uh, multiple systems, right? So ideally, uh, with uh, increased、uh, sort of business connectivity, we can even go and use it abroad, right? Because now, if you take the Indian、um, QR codes. Uh, in East Asia as well, Singapore, they all use the EMB Core standard. So then, if we have a some、uh, 
agreement with those countries, then we can even go and use our uh, local uh, QR code scanning app abroad, right? So most important thing is it's very low cost, right? So when we uh, launched Lanka QR, we got together with all the financial institutions and Lanka Clear, right? And uh, it was for using a less cash society, right? It, sorry, we have this goal, overall goal at the central bank called uh, moving towards a less cash society to reduce the use of cash in the first uh, lecture I discussed this as well because cash is quite costly and there are issues especially with COVID people are now less cash uh, friendly but this this uh, uh, goal of ours is pre-COVID it's like from about 2018 2017 onwards and um, so Lanka QR was brought in for one of those purposes, especially for financial inclusion, right? And because it's for financial inclusion and looking at the lower end of the markets, uh, of the, the sort of smaller merchants and customers with the smaller uh, wealth, the Lanka QR solution is extremely low cost, right? And the customers are not charged at all. And the merchants, can have just the sticker because we can use the QR code on the paper. So that is one really, really good feature of the QR code technology, right? And so the QR code the issuing member institutions just give it for free. And then the MDR, the merchant discount rate, uh, do you all know what the merchant discount rate is? Does anyone know what merchant discount rate is? Uh, so merchant discount rate is kind of like the commission or the payment that you have to make for using electronic, when you're using an electronic payment instrument. So it's mainly in cards. Uh, the QR codes also have the same um, uh, fee. So what happens is uh, when uh, we pay as a customer by the rules of the system rules itself, we are not supposed to be charged any amount than the retail price. But the merchant pays the service provider, that is the card processing or the issuer, uh, um, the acquirer, all of them from the merchant, they take a percentage, right? So 3.5, 1.5, depending on your relationship and your volume and values, uh, this amount is uh, decided. But uh, in Lanka QR, because we were targeting the low end, we want to keep it very low. And so the regulation says 1%, but in 2020 and 2021, we have said, uh, it's uh, five percent, sorry, point five percent, because we launched it through the apps in 2020. So, to it was before, it was just before COVID. Actually, it was quite uh, interesting. We had launched it just before COVID, and so um, and then COVID hit. But from that whole year and uh, last year also, and it's actually continuing uh, at point five percent to encourage people to use it. Right? and government payments are free of charge. Uh, and the thing about uh, retail payments, I think you, when you're working at branch level, you probably know this, um, you have to really go to the ground level. You can't uh, deploy it um, at a high level and expect it to pick up. So there's been a lot of campaigning uh, promotions all over the country to, um, you may have seen it in the papers. So since 2020, we have been extensively having a lot of campaigns to promote Lanka QR and onboard merchants and customers as well. Um, right, so even newer technologies are things like smart devices, right? So instead of having to use the phone, 
Now this one, this is the payment device is a NFC, right? So it, uh, it's a near field device. And the like the QR code, the, the data is on this. The data that gives access to your bank account is on this ring, right? It's in the, it's in the ring. So this is one uh, of the newer technologies, but there are some people are scared because um, they think, oh, you know, my money will get stolen as I'm moving my hand around, but there are certain safeguards and sometimes regulatory safeguards that come in these countries uh, where they say, okay, if the customer says, okay, this is by mistake, you know, you refund it or something like that, right? Um, and then um, this one, if you haven't seen this now, these are sort of Internet of Things where on the fridge itself you have the payment uh, interface and you can just order things you want on your fridge and the uh, interface is there and you can just make the payment on your fridge itself, right? So there's like a little computer on your fridge. Um, those are the evolutions. And then we have sort of newer technological users which are some things like e-checks, right? This is a, this is a move from going from the conventional paper check to see how we can use it for the electronic format. Because the thing is, the check has some interesting features, right? Uh, like it can be endorsed, or you know, it can be uh, it can. It, it, it is almost cash, right? So uh, because of this, uh, checks are very useful. So there are certain, a lot of work going on to see if you can have e-checks that, that work as well as um, the paper check or any other um, mobile uh, payment method. Let's see, I have a, this, this kind of demonstrates Quick and easy way to put funds into your account. Start by downloading the client access app on your phone or tablet. Sign in with your username and password. You may have to answer a security question. Once you're in the app, Tap the menu and choose Deposit Checks. After you agree to Terms and Conditions, choose the account for the deposit, then hit OK at the top left. Enter the amount. Make sure the check is endorsed. Write for deposit only on it and the account number below that. Then take a photo of the front and back of the check. It works best to put the check on a dark surface that is well lit. Then click Make Deposit. You'll see a confirmation and get a confirmation email too. Having trouble? We're here to help. Just call. So this is the earlier, the, the existing technology for uh, mobile deposits. Now it's actually quite uh, popular in uh, the US where the scan, so you don't have to go to the bank, you can just deposit it um, just the way they showed it. It's quite uh, commonly used. In Sri Lanka also, we are looking at, looking to see whether this is possible, right? Right now, SIDS is used, uh, you, the branch themselves scan it, but we're looking to see how whether the customer themselves can scan it and send. Uh, we also have other projects for e-checks itself. Um, I don't have a video on that one. Um, I'll try to find one, but there have been certain um, certain um, sort of prototype pilots going on for e-checks. Uh, even in Sri Lanka, there has been some work going on. Um, so if I can find you one of those e-check uh, videos, I'll try to show it to you. It's, it, that's also quite interesting. It basically, um, it digitizes the entire check. So all, all the endorsement, everything happens 
on the phone itself. Um, and uh, but of course, the issue is it's another technology. It's another technological development, and already there are apps. So whether uh, how people and a lot of people are forgetting, like you know, the negotiable negotiability of a check that means you can transfer it to someone so these are issues that need to be considered uh, we'll see how those things come in the future though um yeah any questions so far so we've come to the end of this uh, sort of as i said i wanted to sort of ease you all into the different instruments um do you all have any questions uh, so far on what we discussed The last few slides weren't uh, they are in the tube that was uploaded. Right. So I haven't sent you this one uh, mm -hmm. because that was the one that I sent for the last in the last lecture. We uh, remember I went into the second lecture because we had more time. Uh, so this is uh, these are new slides. So you don't have this. So I'll just send it off. I didn't have time to sort of send it off to you before the uh, before the the lecture so i will send this off to you now um yeah so that's that uh, any other questions on what you uh, learned Right. So when your examinations are, we were discussing whether to have the presentations or not. I uh, couldn't discuss with IBSL um, on the presentation format, but uh, 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 most likely, as I said last time, we are tending towards having it. So you can pick on any of these topics um, and uh, consider uh, what um, you can, you'd like to do, and if you'd like, you can just ask me as well uh, whether it works. Um, and um, that's, uh, and also for the exam, uh, generally, even in the last paper, I generally have questions like, okay, name, define a digital payment, and then name. Uh, some of them and describe how they work or something like that or sometimes the pros and cons like the risks involved and then the benefits uh, since this is a postgraduate course I try to throw in a more slightly analytical question as well so not just what uh, things are but pros and cons as because you all are going into a managerial decision making levels now so when you all are see whether something is good or bad what are the benefits uh, how are these things changing because change is something that's really really important we have to uh, know that uh, technologies can change right so sometimes you put in a lot of effort for, for a technology and by the time it's launched it's already outdated so you have to know those uh, know those sides of uh, using uh, any any technology um, so those are sort of the critical aspects things like data protection and now what we saw in the youtube videos about you know your when you're using alipay if you're using alipay from another country your still your data is still going to china so things like that you have to look at uh, we have 45 minutes left today so I'd like to go to the next lecture. So let's take a five minute break. I'll send both these lectures out to you now. Um, so I'll just tell Carl, I'm gonna forward it to you. And we'll start on the institutional network. That's a little sort of heavy on the tech side, but uh, more explanation and discussion. Uh, but let's start because we have some extra time. So that we have- Yes, uh, I have one question. Um, yeah. 
मोबाइल मनी दैट वन डज बैंक ऑलवेज हैव टू बी इन्वॉल्व्ड इन इट यस यस दैट मोबाइल सर्विस प्रोवाइडर्स जस्ट कांट डू इट नो बैंक हैज टू ऑलवेज बी इन्वॉल्व्ड that is the so even for the fintech apps that's the same it's the same so if you have that there, there are certain fintech apps uh, you will hear see things like uh, direct pay one pay uh, those are fintech apps actually they are not bank apps like solo or, or smart pay or people's wave uh, those are by fintech companies on banks but All of them have come with the bank, so these those uh, direct pay one pay they come with Kargis Bank. Um, so like that, uh, all of them uh, even for mobile money, easy cash, M cash, they have their uh, custodian bank. Otherwise, they don't get the approval. Anything else? Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, just a small matter uh, yeah, okay. on uh, these uh, mobile phone based systems and uh, similar other products is uh, will you be uh, i mean the technicality on those things uh, how it works on practical way will it be uh, shared in these uh, lectures or i mean the Practical, how it works. Oh, like how to use it. Uh, how 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 it uh, practically implemented? Like how the banks are involved in that uh, mechanism. Oh, right, right, right. So what we'll do is actually that this is what and this is I just wanted to sort of ease you all into the different uh, different um, systems, uh, different products that are available, the different payment instruments. Um, and then we'll go into the institutional framework then we'll go into the regulatory framework right so one by one and when as we go into the reg once we finish the regulatory framework i will go into the regulations so in each regulation there is how to you know how to adopt lanka qr how to adopt Uh, what you should do when you are doing a mobile f- a fintech app uh, that is what you want right like how do you start how does a bank get into this or how how does a bank what does a bank have to do that is your question right yeah what what are the yeah. benefits and uh, difficulties faced by banks and when when when, when the banks involved in these things will be liberated i think Mm-hmm. All right, right. All right. I, uh, so you are talking about from a business implementation perspective, right? Yes. All right. So I haven't actually uh, considered that side. So thank you for it. I can actually. We let's see. Let me see where we can add. I I don't mind having that discussion. I think a lot of you will have to jump in as well uh, from your experience. I mean, I can share from whatever experience that we have. and uh, wh- whatever the lessons that we can share with you um we will uh, now after we let me just see um right so what i'll do is after we right so when i finish the legal framework and tell you from a legal angle uh what needs to be done at that point so in case i don't stress on it just remind me so at th- there i will tell you all the pitfalls and the especially like for apps we have the minimum compliance guideline um you know it's not easy it's not easy to comply even though it's called minimum compliance guideline so all those pitfalls and the challenges uh i will highlight we'll discuss that we'll i'll, I'll definitely add a slide for that thank you for that uh, anything uh, and then uh, so when we come to that point i would also like your engagement so keep that it's it will be important just do a little uh, discussion with your colleagues as well what your experience is and i will bring what we have seen as issues uh, and how as the industry has resolved these things uh and most of them get reflected in the uh, 
in the regulations as well, uh, the problems uh, and how to correct, correct them as well. Uh, it's quite a dynamic field and you will see that there are a lot of regulations that come out, uh, operating instructions, a lot of those things that come in, just so that it goes and it's also not restrictive. Um, so that we'll add, I'll add after the legal framework. I'll just make a note of that. Uh, anything else? Uh, if there's nothing else, we can, uh, what would you like? It's, uh, we have about a uh, little over half an hour. Would you like to start the next uh, lecture that we will have tomorrow? Or do you want to start it uh, tomorrow itself? I'm okay either way. We can start it now, no? Okay. So let's, uh, I'll come back in uh, about uh, three, four minutes and we'll start. I'll just have some water and come back. Right? Okay. So I'm back. Uh, we have uh, an, a new student, I think, who's joined us today, Puli. You were there last time, right? Is Puli here? Yes, I was there. Can do you mind? Well, you were you weren't there last time, right? Were you there last time? Sorry. Were you there last week, last lesson? Uh, you mean uh, you asking about the lesson? No, no. Were you did did we meet before? Did you come to the? First yeah, time? yeah. Uh, actually, I have changed my name. Previously, <laughs> I have put Laksara Pereira. Yeah. Ah, right, right, right. Okay. Of course. Right. <laughs> I thought you were a student. Okay. Uh, right. Um, uh, so let's start. The uh, very text heavy uh, presentation. Right. So don't mind that, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, so now we are going to go into the institutional framework to discuss different actors, right? Uh, so before we look at uh, uh, the issues that are faced and how, how you should, um, how you should uh, comply and uh, how you can get these things done, we need to first see what is everyone's role in a payment infrastructure. So if you recall the definitions of payment, also I just, just before I forget, I sent Kalinga the, this, these slides, I just sent it now, these slides and the previous slides. Uh, so Kalinga should have it. Uh, so hopefully he'll send it to you uh, fairly soon. Um, so, yeah, so the institutional framework is basically what are the institutions that all add up in a payment infrastructure. The definition of payment infrastructures also include the institutional framework. So it's not just, uh, when we say in, uh, infrastructure, it's not just uh, the technological infrastructure, it's also the institutional and the legal infrastructure, right? Uh, so same goes, right, institutional framework. Um, I have used very big font here. Let me make it a little small, it's too big for me to read. Um, so, um, right, so the institutional framework uh, comprises of laws, regulations, all the stakeholders, uh, public-private institutions, including their roles, their practices, systems, procedures, all of that fall into what is considered institution, right? So it, the word institution means it's coming from institutionalized. It's it's uh, things that are embedded. So if something is just done ad hocly once in the entire history 
uh, and never done again, uh, then that is not an institutional thing. That is an ad hoc event. But if something is done according to some set rules and to be repeated or to be followed uh, by not by more than like one person, then there is a it becomes institutionalized, right? So there is a in in banking there is a industry practices there is an industry understanding of how things work even so banking regulations came after banking itself came right um and so you there are a simple example is that there are banks in sri lanka that are older than the central bank because the regulation comes after Right. So first there are practices and we, that things are done. And then when a regulator is required, it will enter the scene. Right. Um, so in the institutional framework of the payments industry is very complex. Right. Uh, it is far more complex than a lot of people think it is. It is not as easy as paying. The institutional framework is uh, it, it's made up of a lot of uh, lot of uh, stakeholders. And um, it's also interconnected with uh, external countries, right? So it, it, its complexity increases more. Um, so we will first look at the institutions and then go into the legal framework. So the typical stakeholders in a payment industry are you have central banks, you have the banks, then non-bank payment service providers. Uh, like the finance companies, the e-money providers, like the mobile operators, then you have the new category called the fintechs, right? Um, anyone would like to, uh, I think we discussed this word last time, if I remember correctly. Anyone would like to just quickly um, say what a fintech is? Just so that we remind ourselves what it is. Did I did I explain this last time? I vaguely remember. No. Do you all know? Do you all have you have you heard the word fintech? Yeah, it's like using technology to provide financial service. Yes, yes, it is uh, technology to provide. We are using the the qualities of. I think I think it was uh, your lecture. Sorry, some to say the lectures mixed up uh, because I give several lectures. Um, uh, that uh, where we use. Um, yes, it was your lecture. Um, where we use uh, the the certain qualities of uh, technology. You know, like. Uh, interoperability where when you have standard then you can use it among different devices or different types of digital uh, channels right like apis are we learn those words those are sort of standardized interfaces so because digital technology has that quality and those features we can generate new types of financial services and ways of delivering financial services to customers using those technologies and when that is done it's called fintech otherwise if we just use a computer system like a database or you know like what what we're already using those are not fintech that is using uh, technology in financial services this is using sort of technology for financial services right and then you have payment infrastructure providers. So definition of a bank, right? So banks are generally considered as an institution that simultaneously accepts deposit and provide credit, right? So you are doing deposit mobilization and you uh, provide credit as well. So when both those happen, you become a bank, right? And uh, also, banks have this ability, if you're a commercial bank, you have added uh, 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 privileges such as ability to create money, right? Issue checks. Uh, so, the several member EU member states extend the requirement for a license and the definition of a bank in EU uh, 
legal terms, which is a credit to institution, to institutions that grant credit, but do not take deposits. And those institutions can be granted access to central bank money. That is, they have also the link with the central bank, right? They are credit institutions only. So this is in EU, right? In uh, the US, a bank is synonymous with a depository institution, including both domestically chartered institutions and US branches and agencies in foreign banks, right? In the US, the bank category also includes state licensed trust companies that are members of the Fed Reserve System, that is the central bank system of the US, right? Such as the Depository Trust Company and EJACT Corporation. So that is a corporation institution under this act, which is referred to as the EJACT, right? Um, and the, the, so such as the CLS Bank, I think it's a clearing bank. Um, these types of institutions are also allowed to maintain an account with the central bank, right? So as you can see, these definitions, so this is the more standardized international definition of uh, a bank. But uh, within a country, within a region, you can extend it to different, uh, to capture different institutions. The reason I put the EU and the US uh, definitions is so that we know that you can have deviations, right? You can extend this. You have the freedom to slightly extend it, but primarily this deposit taking and credit issuing, right? So the, those two are there and they're all licensed, right? That's the important thing, right? Yeah. So the role of banks. Um, so uh, banks have a special pay, uh, status in payments uh, that it reflects that they are the principal providers of the payment services, right? And this is because they hold the public's money, right? Or the way our banking, our monetary system is made in, a, in, in almost all countries because we are following the business, uh, the Western monetary model. Um, banks are integral to that model, right? So you have the bank and then you have the central bank that is issuing money. And it is through that when you join that system, you only you get all the benefits of that system and for that the banks have to hold the settlement accounts right with the central bank and they also have to hold the accounts of the customers it's when you do both that only this system works uh, banks providing payments is uh, payment services to other banks and non-bank accounts uh, for the largest flow through most payment systems so because banks have all the accounts of all the customers and they have settlement accounts with the central bank, right? Do you all know what settlement accounts with the central banks are? Do you know what a settlement account with the central bank is? Do you know that uh, oh, in Sri Lanka it is the commercial banks that can hold a central bank account? Um, do you know that your bank has an, uh, an account with the central bank? Yes. Okay, so I mean that comes with the, the central bank is the banker to banks. So, and here actually in Sri Lanka it is banker to mainly to the commercial banks that because that we will discuss why that structure is like that. Um, so, the under the Monetary Law Act, which we will discuss next time, um, the commercial banks can hold settlement accounts with the central bank to settle their obligations between banks, right? So, when you have to uh, pay another bank, you don't, uh, the channel that you use it via the, is via the central bank. And then, like we use our bank accounts that are held with XYZ bank, the banks use their accounts held with the central bank to move the money around. Otherwise, there is no point where they can link it. Unless each bank goes and gives a board of cash to the other bank, there is no point for the banks to connect and 
transfer their money, right? So to do that, you have settlement banks with the um, with the central banks, and in Sri Lanka, it is the um, the commercial banks that so licensed commercial banks, LCBs that have uh, the settlement accounts, right? Uh, and if you are wondering what happens to the other banks, they come into this system as secondary members, right? Uh, via the LCBs. Um, and at the end of the day, now when we look at the, when we study the payment systems like RTGS, slips, and the flows that are going through, you will see, ah, no, last time we saw this, the huge interbank uh, numbers, uh, the trillions of rupees that uh, are transferred uh, between banks. So those are mainly, finally, most of the money goes between banks because uh, we give instructions to the banks to send money. So most of it, the per payment systems are mostly used by banks themselves, right? Um, so the role of banks have evolved historically from being only commercial entities that act as intermediaries uh, to being uh, to playing a dual role in both business-oriented commercial entities as well as the front line for implementing financial industry regulation and almost as agents of the central bank. Now this is an interesting concept because um, initially, as I said, the banks came before the central bank. The central bank came, uh, central banks in the world uh, mainly came with after uh, the Second World War because the world went into a new monetary system, we got into the gold standard and all of that. Um, and that the market needed that regulating because the, there was no standardized system because sometimes you think, in any market, if there are imbalances or if things are not happening smoothly, then you need a regulator, right? That's where central banks came in because it was growing and more people were using banking and there's more money going into banks. Then there is more chance for fraud and all these issues. And it becomes systemically important because most people's money is now in the banks. They're not holding it at home. So in that sense, you need some regulation to come in. Right, that's when the central banks came in, and now the banks are not only doing their commercial and uh, commercial work, like you know, servicing their customers and getting more business. They are also um, implementing industry regulations. Right, they are like the agents of the central bank, or the delegates of the central bank. Uh, so in, when you conduct um, a KYC processing or compliance you're kind of doing an extended work, a regulatory aspect within the bank itself. So there is a level of self-regulation and compliance that comes with the bank um, because of all the regulations that are there. So you can't just only do your commercial activity. You have to maintain the stability of the economy. The banks indirectly get that responsibility to ensure the safety of funds, uh, to make sure that there is no fraud or terrorist financing, money laundering, that none of that happen. That responsibility falls on the banks, right? So uh, banks' roles are completely, like it's always, it's continuing to evolve with the financial crisis it expanded even more, like their, their focus on compliance. Now, even if for you who are working in banks, you will understand this. You have compliance side has become stronger, right? Risk appetite is less. So those that your role is changing, so you are not just freely uh, uh, in a green field where you can just take people's money and go and uh, invest it anywhere you like, where you can give the loans to anyone you like. You can't do things like that. You're not free to do it like that. A lot of uh, rules that you have to comply with. So uh, today, uh, banks banks would generally uh, carry out roles such as uh, facilitating payments to the public, um, facilitating interbank payments, and also uh, facilitating payments of other banks, like uh, what, uh, what I said about the uh, specialized banks, like the, the savings banks, uh, they come in as secondary participants. Um, 
and uh, for them there is a tiered uh, a membership structure in within the payment systems right so everyone are not equal uh, don't have the equal type of access to the payment systems uh, for risk mainly for risk reasons right uh, they also jointly own the payment infrastructure in the country not only in sri lanka even abroad that uh, the joint owning uh, structure is there uh, uh, institutional structure is there they are engaged in industry policy so the rules that we come up with are not just by us we also consult the um, industry quite a bit and they also come up with proposals and they come to us as well so then you have the enforce regulations as i said and then complying with the regulations and they have the responsibility of ensuring the safety and the stability of the financial system as well uh, now if we come to the central bank um, then we also have roles in uh, the payment system right so we are the settlement agent because as i said if for interbank transactions we are we act as the bank right and we also act as uh, the central banks act as uh, owners and operators of the payments and settlement systems in many countries that is the case right uh, most countries the rtgs is operated by the central bank um, and that is because banks hold their settlement accounts with the central bank and then of course regulating and overseeing payment systems um then uh, providing central bank money for settlement right now a central bank uh, is not only regulating and operating the system they uh, we, we there is central bank money right the money in the settlement accounts uh, so to um, facilitate the convertibility between different forms of money that is you have money that the banks hold then you have checks which are also uh, very liquid almost like money um, so the central bank supports the existence of at least one payment system in their own currency that is what the central bank money right which uh, this what money that central bank directly issues uh, that is accessible to the banks right so this is from the uh, now i'm talking internationally general level right so this is from the committee of payments and settlement system at the bank of international settlements right um so then you go into the more sort of complex side of central bank money um i'm just going to tell you this because it's a i i want you to know this but i'm not going to sort of question you on, at the exam because they these are we are going into the concepts of money and that's not really the purpose of this course but i want you all to know the basis of where things are coming from because when you all are going to do new things right or if some problem arises it's better to at least have some slight idea there are these concepts like this and when you when you are trying to make a decision you will re remember them right and you must not disturb them too much or you must see what you are disrupting whether you are disrupting the core or whether you are disrupting some market right so you you must think very very hard before you think of disrupting the core because the core we can upset the entire economy right <coughs> Uh, so uh, this, uh, the central bank money is, of course, their safety, availability, and neutrality and finality, right? Um, and then um, the failure of financial of settlement institutions can have critical systemic consequences, right? Um, and the money issued by the central bank uh, minimizes the risk of this occurring, right? Because the central bank issues its own money right so this is like a conceptual thing so if the settlement when you are doing a settlement if there is no money then uh, there is no money that is the fact of it but if you are with a institution that can uh, that has its own money then 
it can ensure that the process happens uh, in a you know temporarily ensure that the smooth flow is not disrupted like later you can settle it amongst the banks but when for the settlement happens on a time basis right so if you don't have funds and then the settlement can't be done the entire transaction and then even at the economic level there is a there can be a risk right that's how the financial crisis and all of those things happen so it's very important that the person who's acting as the settlement agent has access to these funds right if you see how it's done when we are studying rtgs um and then the see uh, there are core principles for system there are things for systemically important payment systems right that are designated so in sri lanka rtgs and the check clearing system are designated in systemically important payment systems which means that if something goes wrong in these systems it will em impact the entire system in the in, sorry if yeah, when i say in system if, if something goes wrong in these payment systems it will impact the entire financial system and the economy it can impact all the economic transactions or the all the customers a good example that of systemic risk is the financial crisis the global financial crisis in 2008 which happened with subprime mortgages uh, where they were giving out loans uh on 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 almost uncollateralized loans right for mortgages and they were selling the mortgages and repackaging them and sending them to europe and it was just like a like a paper or some document that was getting traded there was nothing underlying and then this created a big bubble which burst and there was no money in it um so th this is what we need to um ensure so the settlement asset is very important to minimize credit and liquidity risk mm. there's also a lot of stuff on central bank money uh, so regardless of the payment system used right settlement takes place via the participants accounts that are maintained at the central bank right so the central banks will facilitate the settlement process making available their own funds on secure basis right so if if the banks doesn't have enough money they can give their uh, like securities like um, their treasury bill holdings or something like that and get a loan a temporary loan and settle the money right so the real time gross settlement that is rtgs a central bank can uh, could provide intraday liquidity which we do right Where that is sometimes now uh, now rtgs settles real time right so when the uh, when the transaction happens it the money has to go between each bank so sometimes the banks because banks hold a limited amount of money right so sometimes the bank might not have that amount of money at that time of the day right to pay the other bank but if you don't pay a big amount is not going to the other bank so that will cause a systemic issue so to do so to prevent that the central bank gives an intraday loan right a facility and uh, to at the end of the day the bank settles the central bank so this is to ensure that um, the money is flowing around because all banks are waiting for the money to come because then they because for their purposes they need the money to come in so they can't wait for the other person to find the money and come so so to facilitate this on a temporary basis central bank gives liquidity on an intraday basis that means you take it let's say in the morning in the evening when the system uh, closes before the system closes you have to settle um, ila right that is intraday liquidity facility um so for deferred net settlement that is if you are not settling real time and you're paying net, you net out all the obligations uh, between you and the other banks and then you just have to pay the net amount uh, we don't need to give uh, such uh, funding facilities right 
um, from a Manchuan's perspective, the critical aspect in uh, the provision of uh, central bank funds is that they are returned at the end of the day so that there is no outflow of central bank money into circulation. Because, you know, when if one central bank issues money to the public, it becomes in inflationary because it's new money, right? So we just issue it and we take it back so that we don't affect inflation. This is this purpose is mainly to ensure the smooth functioning of the uh, payment systems and the economic activity so that people can transact without an issue. So we give the money to the banks to settle it and then we take it back at the end of the day. Right. So different central banks manage liquidity in settlement systems differently in mature economies with like Japan and Switzerland. Uh, they have very good liquidity management of the bank, so they don't have intraday liquid facilities at all, right? That means, like, like what I explained in the in the previously, like sometimes the bank has to make a payment to the other bank because the customer is requesting, let's say, uh, some big purse, some big business transaction. A bank doesn't have enough liquidity to give up because if they do, then they can't service the other functions right so uh, and then the other bank also doesn't have enough liquidity so it's waiting for this bank to send the money in, right um because now when you do an rtgs payment the other the the customer who's receiving the money wants to withdraw the money at the other end that's why we are using real time right so the money has to go and just because we have money in our accounts so when we look at our accounts and they say there are so many millions of rupees, it doesn't mean that the bank is holding all those millions, right? So we all, you all know this, you all are bankers, you all already know this concept. Um, so, um, but in an advanced economy that have good liquidity management, you don't need this because they have managed it properly, right? So this is a, a point that we can reach. Of course, remember ILF is most countries, UK, uh, a lot of European countries, they have ILF, right? So I think Japan and Switzerland are well known for their efficiency and time management. And also based on that, liquidity management is coming, is connected to being able to manage the times that money is coming in and going out as well. Uh, now in uh, countries such as UK, USA, Europe, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, there is intraday liquidity, right? Um, so, uh, central bank as a settlement agent, uh, whether or not a bank directly uses central bank settlement systems to settle its transactions depends on the nature of the bank. Direct, uh, directly settling participant uh, will require certain financial and technological commitments and uh, it's cheaper and the financial uh, technological commitments are also less if you are indirectly connecting via another bank, right? Um, thus, access to RTG systems are generally tiered, right? Uh, because those that is the core settlement system of the country. So, unless you meet the technological, like the safety requirements, the risk, uh, uh, risk mitigation requirements, unless you meet all those very high standards, you can't get access to the RTG system. So for several banks, that is too expensive. So they instead, they go via another bank and pay that bank some amount and get the RTGS access, right? And globally, this tiered system is practiced because it minimizes risk and also reduces cost to smaller banks. Um, so, so central bank as the owner and operator of payments and settlement systems. No, oh, it's nine o'clock already. Let's just, where are we? Um, we'll, um, this is, where are we? Okay, here we are. Um, so, as you can see, RTJ systems, which are operated by the central bank, um, are used. So mo most countries have RTJ systems, right? 
uh, now. And most of them are operated, owned and operated by the central bank themselves, right? And central, central bank is uh, operating as a settlement agent as well, right? Uh, and there are, of course, some countries with multiple RGD systems, right? So not just one. So those are different systems that countries think they need. When we discuss what RTGS is, you will get a better idea, but I want you to, so step by step, we have to figure out, okay, who these are the people who are involved, these are the systems that are coming into place. Central banks main, in terms of payment settlements, so operating the settlement system, which is RTGS, that is finally the money going between the two banks, that, that point, is very, very crucial for the stability of the payments system and the financial system, right? Um, and then the central bank regulates and oversees payment systems. With the increased sophistication of payment systems, the widespread connectivity of different parts of the economy, uh, payment systems become very system systemically important, right? So what that means is, um, because all of us are connect now using bank accounts, and connecting uh, digitally into them, the points of vulnerability, the points that are weak points are more. Now, if someone can hack in through anyone's, uh, if we don't follow the proper safety measures, then it can get hacked in. And if someone is really uh, sophisticated in hacking, they can enter a bank system, right? So that then that ensuring that your systems are more sophisticated is very, very important, right? So regulating and overseeing these systems are very important. Um, therefore, uh, payment systems are regulated to avoid potential failure and ensure financial st system stability and safeguard uh, public funds, right? Um, so I'll stop here. Um, and yeah, we'll stop here today and we'll continue this tomorrow and, um, yeah, we'll continue this tomorrow and start, uh, the, okay, we'll, we'll stop here, okay, we'll stop here. Uh, are there any questions? It's this, as I said, it's a bit of a heavy area. So if you haven't understood or you have no clue what I said, just let me know. So even tomorrow I can explain again uh, what all this means. Um, any questions? Right. If there are no questions, we'll stop for today. So thank you for joining um, uh, after work. Uh, I think all of us are after work, so it's a bit tired, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll do these sessions because even, um, on, um, okay. Um, so even on Saturday, I think just a few more joined in. Uh, we'll see how it goes um, and we'll continue this as we planned. Um, so regarding the weekend, we can have a chat tomorrow. Uh, as I, I mean, initially, as I said that day, we are, it's better to avoid the long weekends. But if, um, We'll see how it goes, uh, and if at least a few can join in, um, we can have some sessions during the long weekends as well, if uh, you all are available. Of course, we'll keep some of them free because uh, this reduction of, you know, I, I, someone needs to turn up, and my experience is that people go off in the long weekends, so even if you don't have a plan suddenly families turn up with plans and these are the realities of life. Um, so uh, let's meet tomorrow again and finish this and then we can go into the 
in the section after that. Right. Thank you.